while I'm talking, something's going to happen to you. Something's going to happen to you wherever you're hearing me from. You're going to feel a strange hope and a strange sense that the problems that weigh you down and the feelings that seem to dominate your mind and your heart are going to lose their power. And you're going to believe. See what I meant about the audience? <laughs> and you're going to feel hope, powerful hope. And you're going to make a decision. When I ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask you to stand at the end of this. And by the way, I've already started my speech. I'm not introducing it anymore. I'm actually giving it. You will find your legs carrying you down here. You'll feel a lightness. Some of you will even feel like running because you'll know that it is the end of your nightmare. It is the end of your pain. It is the end of your despair. Before there was Billy Graham, there was a man named E. Stanley Jones. And the fact that we don't know a lot about him anymore is a tragedy. He was once on the cover of Time magazine and labeled the greatest Christian missionary in the world. And on the major radio networks of the day, he would debate the most famous atheists. And he wouldn't do it just by himself. He would have a round table, and it was called the Forum, taken from ancient Rome. And in the Forum, the intellectuals of America were permitted to introduce two or three, maybe four, of the greatest thinkers who were atheists to sit at that round table. And Dr. Jones would not reveal who would sit on his side. He'd never let you know what American or British intellectual he was going to present. And five minutes before it was time to start on live radio, he was joined with new converts people that had just become Christians. And he picked them deliberately by design. Now, it tells us in the book of Revelation, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, so the atheist would begin and the atheists would say all of the usual suspects, gather them together, the historical facts, the irrationality of the Old Testament miracles, and on and on and on it would go. And then Dr. Jones would ask one of the young people at the forum, how did you find Christ? And the atheists would be rankled by the fact that instead of being given an argument with some intellectual weight, they were being told the experience. The experience. Why did the Bible say they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony? Because you can't argue with someone that has met Jesus. You can't, you can't debate someone that is, you can't back them down or get them to change the subject. And here's the most dangerous part. It's real. So tonight I'm going to read something to you and how Dr. Jones would win all those contests. But by the end of the day, the young people would stand there and say, you know what? I know what you said, Mr. Atheist. But let me tell you, once I was lost and now I am found. Once I had no hope, now I know. You know, the last time I got to hear Dr. Jones, and it was a miracle that I got to, he was 95 years old, preaching at the Lutheran Pacific Seminary in Berkeley. And I heard he was coming, this frail 95-year-old man,
coming to a seminary that had left the Bible, left tradition, believing that evangelical regular Christians were nuts. And these, they, they had had this open, they, their minds were so open their brains fell out. And this frail, thin man with white hair stood there and he looked at the audience and he said, there's a reason you will never win. You'll never win. You'll never be able to bury or defeat Christ and this, the Word of God. For one reason, it's real. So I'm going to look at this audience right now that used to be on drugs and used to want to kill yourself and used to worship the devil and used to believe that life was a cruel joke, but then you met the Son of God and your life was changed. You tell me now, is it real? Is it real? Can I want you to know this. If I had one gift, if Mario Murillo could have one gift from God that would settle the argument and set you free, if there was one thing in my life that God could give me, is if I could reach in my soul and touch you with the joy and the peace that lives in this man, then the argument would be settled because you would see how cocaine, meditation, mythology, satanic worship in the occult, it's absolute garbage when you feel the peace and the joy of Christ in your soul. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Mario, you make me feel like I'm a terrible person. You're so loved of God that God sent his son. He became a man, and on the cross he died. Paul said, I wish you could be like me. Look at me right now. I wish you could be like me. Mario Morello saying it to this crowd. I wish that every one of you could be like me. God gave me a beautiful wife, a woman of God. God gave me a crazy son that I love with all my heart. When he was 16 years old, I woke him up. I said, we're going to Washington. He said, why, Dad? I said, I'm going to get you with the president while you still know everything. <laughs> I travel. I'm persecuted. I'm rejected. People lie about me. CNN stays awake at night because of me. When you write and you make a list in journalism, there's a rule of writing that you begin from the least to the greatest. So if you make a list of things that are beautiful in journalism or in writing, you'll talk about something that's sort of beautiful, more beautiful, and ultimately the most beautiful. The reverse works the other way. When you talk about tragedy or evil, you'll list the minor sin and it'll escalate to the last one on the list. The worst is saved for last or the best is saved for last. When Paul started to describe the day you're living in, he talked about the dehumanization, how natural love would go away, how we would be attracted to the dark and the unnatural, how we would call it art how we would take a disease and celebrate it as a liberating personal lifestyle. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, unnatural. But the worst is saved for last. Here's what Paul said, know this in the last days perilous times will come for men will love themselves. They will love money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. If you look at it, 
there's a graduating scale there. We're going from the least sin to the greatest, the least problem to the greatest, the most, the dangerous wickedness to the most dangerous. And it says this, disobedient to parents, incapable of feeling gratitude, attracted to what's unholy and godless, unable to love anything, Unforgiving in the original language means they can't heal from a wound. Their, their life is stuck in that moment that the divorce happened or that someone died. They can't heal. They can't let it go. Slanders without self-control. Brutal. Hating people just because they're moral. Haters of good. Traitors. Capable of occupying a political office and selling your own nation down the river. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure. Whatever it is that feels good, I'm going to do it. Rather than lovers of God. And then at the end of the list, at the end of the list, having a form of godliness but denying its power over their life. In other words, they've been to church. And you went to church, but you didn't get right with God. You became immune. You learned how to be around it and spout it and say it, but not know it. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you what the Bible said about all these people in this list. It said that it's like a cork is pulled out of their heel and their, their humanness drains out. They can't feel. They dread and they fear. And every day life gets harder and harder to bear. Now, you'll tell me in your dangerous condition, well, I'm a Christian. I know God. I go to church. I carry a Bible. I, I can quote it. But then you forget that's never what the apostles taught. That was never the focus of the Word of God. That was never what the church was supposed to do, is get people to say the right thing. It was to make them the right being. Watch me. I know you believe in Christ, but the loneliness, the depression, the addiction, the brokenness of your soul rails against you and tells you you're in the greatest danger of all. Because the prostitute might one day have such a horrible experience that she'll come to her senses. You might never. Because you have that harmless dose of Christian church culture that has never repented or said, Jesus, you are the absolute Lord of my existence. And that's why the joy never kicked in. That's why the peace never came through. That's why your life has been a cycle of things get better and then they break apart and they fall. 